if you want to know what uh, what an object is in physics, the way you present it for the purposes of physics, you point to it. Okay. So if you want to know what a rock is, you point to it. Say rock. Okay. Very simple. Kindergarten stuff. Uh, you want to know what a house is, you uh, point to it and you say house. See how simple it is? Very simple. And if you want to know what a um, uh, what a table is, well, you point and you say table. Okay, very simple, straightforward. Hopefully there are no questions. You know, that's the way we present objects in physics. Okay, so any object that you want to present and you say, look, this is going to be the actor in my movie. This is going to be the actor in my theory, right? You point to them at the beginning, starting, so that people can follow your presentation and they know what you're going to be talking about. They know what it is that is moving. Okay, you point and name. Okay, so um, if you want to explain uh, some of these words that I just mentioned, you know, like counter space, uh, ether, field, etc., you want to explain that to a, or, or you want to introduce them, not explain them, but introduce them to a, uh, uh, an ET, for example, a Klingon. Well, again, you got to point and name. Okay, so uh, here it is. Uh, you know, you say, uh, what is counter space, Sam? You know, and uh, please point to it it right because it's got to be an it only objects can be it's so you point and you say okay that's counter space straightforward real easy right and uh if you want to introduce the uh ether you uh point and say ether and there you have to point to it so that people know you point with your inner finger and say ether and so everybody knows what you're going to talk about you, they know what the object is that you're going to be moving in your theory Okay, so you point and name. Very simple. Very kindergarten stuff. Okay. Okay. So, um, you know, I asked the people to go in there and uh, tell me what the ether is, but not to tell me, but to illustrate it. To go on the internet and find a place where they show what the ether is. Or, you know, upload your own picture. I don't care. You know, uh, just upload a picture and say, look, that's the ether. And so we know what you're what what you have going through your mind when you say the word ether or the word counter space or the word field or whichever right and uh these are the images that you will see you know if you put ether out there okay and uh it's very simple you know uh you say okay what is the ether and these are the images you get in google images and what you see is what people think of as the ether and you can see they're all thinking of different things they all illustrate different things okay just in case, uh, I went in there and looked for the luminiferous ether, which is the one that concerns science, and this is what you get. Okay, you get uh, all these pictures, and what you see is that the ether are a bunch of lines, you know, all these lines that go across the earth and the sun and all this stuff. Uh, here's a better picture, and when you take everything out, like suns, uh, stars, planets, when you remove everything, this is what, what's left of the ether okay there it is that's what the ether looks like according to all these sites that's the luminiferous ether okay very clear and the question is what it what is it that we're staring at what what is that <laughs> what are you looking at you're looking at a bunch of arrows there a dotted lined arrows uh is that what the ether is a uh, bunch of dots with uh arrows at the end of them you know th this is what you get this is the illustration you get for the ether and so if this is not the ether, what is the ether? Because there you see an illustration of the ether. Okay, and you don't have to take my word for it. You can go into uh, do a Google um, uh, images of the luminiferous ether, and that's what you'll get. And so when I ask people to illustrate the ether, they say, oh, Bill, you're, you're playing word games. This is a straightforward question. I mean, <laughs> there shouldn't be any, any way, you know, you shouldn't put your tail between your legs and run away. You should say, look, this is the ether, Bill. This is what I'm talking about. Very straightforward. Okay? Very easy. In fact, that's what, what all these dissidents, you know, uh, they have, the problem they have with the establishment is the fact that they don't like, the, especially the word time, but in general, the word space-time. You know, uh, establishment says, look, uh, gravity is the warpage of space-time. It's the bending of space-time. That's what, you know, geometry and these people say, what do you mean space-time? What is space-time? And again, they're thinking of, you know, 
show me what space time is, you know, and what you see out there, what they'll put out there is something like this, okay? They point uh, to a little fishnet, and they say, look, the uh, sun works, uh, weighs down the, the uh, canvas, creates a depression, and because of that depression, the earth rolls around this depression, has no way of getting out of this, um, of this depression, of this roulette-like mechanism, okay? So the earth goes around the sun because it's, uh, the sun is weighing down a hole, okay, depression, and uh, the earth goes around. And all dissidents say, this is nonsense, this is bunk, what is this nonsense? And why? Because again, th what they have in, in the back of their mind is, uh, is that they, um, they can't understand the object that is being presented. Sometimes they present it as a 3D object here. You see the 3D version of space now, which is even bigger bunk. <clears throat> because they say, look, you know, uh, it's misrepresented in the two-dimensional world. You have to represent it in the 3D world. Okay, there you have more or less a 3D world. Okay, what is this nonsense? They're saying that all these, um, this canvas, instead of uh, the sun weighing it downwards, uh, the, the sun pulls it towards its center. And so does the earth. And so the earth doesn't fly away from the sun because the sun, the sun is pulling the um, canvas towards its center and the earth is pulling the, uh, the uh, canvas towards its center. Well, the first thing uh, I need to mention is that Einstein would laugh at all these people saying that they're a bunch of, and I'll be kind, they're a bunch of idiots <laughs> because that's not what relativity says at all. But that's aside from the, you know, beside the point. The issue here is that if the sun pulls whatever canvas that is, whatever that thing is, towards the center and the earth towards the center, well, then we have to identify those lines. What are those lines? You know, what are, what are we talking about? And what you're staring at are number lines. That's what those lines are, number lines. Okay, they're not length, width, and height. They're not even that. They're not dimensions. They're not coordinates. They are number lines. That's what a mathematician deals with. So we're pulling number lines towards the center of the earth and the center of the sun. And so they say, look, it's not that the earth or the sun weighs the 2D canvas downwards. It's, a, it, it's pulling the 3D canvas inwards towards the center, towards the singularity. And don't ever fall into singularity because uh, they say that the laws of physics break down there. <laughs> so, so uh, you know, you're not governed by the laws of physics anymore once you fall into the singularity. So we have nonsense and bigger nonsense. That's all we have. And so all the dissidents, rightfully, uh, you know, point that out and say, look, you know, uh, it's, uh, what you're saying is nonsense. You're saying that there's a bending of warp uh, of, of space time. You're warping time. You know, what is this? That's not a mechanism. That's nonsense. And they're totally right. You know, this is poppycock. But uh, why? Because nobody can deal with the object of space time as an object. That's the issue. That's the underlying issue. Especially when they say, look, it's four dimensional and you cannot even imagine it. That makes it even worse because they're they're just um, sidestepping the issue. They're just saying, no, you can't imagine it, so don't try, but we've proven it. <laughs> okay, <laughs> you've proven it. Great. Okay, so this is um, this is the starting point, and uh, so people ask questions, and here's uh, one fellow who brought up an issue, and a uh, second guy who uh, also doubled up on that, and they said the following. The first guy said, the ether is electricity. It's uh, magnetism, it's gravity, it's a fluid, it's a fluid, okay, whatever a fluid is, but it's a fluid, okay, ethers is substance, it's a substance, it's a fluid, okay, and then it's a, it's a very physical, it's a, it's very physical, it's a thing, okay, and the other fellow, he said, no, no, you're, you're wrong, <laughs> and uh, supposedly these two fellows are experts in ether, because they, I guess they both proposed the ether, okay, and so they've done some research, on each one on their own, they reach completely different conclusions of what the ether is. That's my point here, okay? And this fellow says, ether is non-spatial, so it cannot be a fluid. Ether has no shape, okay? So it's not physical, it's not a thing because it has no shape, right? It's pure potential. It's a promise. <laughs> okay, that's all it is. Inertial, non-spatial, whatever that is. Anti-spatial, counter-spatial. So we have a counter spatial versus a fluid. That's what it is, whatever those two poor guys are talking about, okay? And uh, yeah, I mean, it's very hard to follow uh, what these people are saying. And so, um, so here, um, so I, I challenge the first guy, in fact, let me put it over here so that uh, 
we can see it better. Uh, the fellow who said it's a fluid, I'm saying, okay, what is a fluid? Well, a fluid, if you look it up, it says a liquid, gas, or other wet material. Okay, so uh, yeah, a fluid is a thing, it's material, and they are substances. Okay, so so far this guy's on the right track, but what are what is a fluid? Well, all substances, all material are made up of atoms and molecules, and uh, you know, and, and and so the question is whether the ether is made up of molecules, atoms, and all this stuff. And he's got to answer that question. I'm not going to answer it for him. I think he's going to say no. Okay, but uh, he's um, the, the ball's in his court, not in mine. He's got to tell me if he's going to say that it's a fluid. Then he's saying it's made out of atoms and or and or molecules. And if he says no to that, then it can't be a fluid because that's what a fluid is. Okay, and so otherwise he's got to define the word fluid in such a way that he uh, you know, encompasses uh, the ether. But the issue is that if ether is a fluid, he still hasn't pointed to it. He just it's a fluid. It's like saying uh, you know table is is furniture and so is chair. Well, furniture is a category, like liquid is a category, like uh, solids and gases, those are categories. You haven't told me anything, you haven't pointed to it. You know, if we say uh, chair, you know, that's furniture, uh, couch, furniture, okay? But by saying that it's furniture, you haven't told me what a chair is. You got to point to chair, okay? And that's different than saying furniture, very generic name, category. And to say it's a fluid, you know, well, we have oil, we have water, we have so many fluids, even mercury flows sometimes, you know, it's hot enough. <laughs> so, uh, no, you can't say it's just a fluid. You haven't told us anything. You have to point and name, okay, that ether. That's very simple stuff that I'm, I'm asking you to do. I'm not asking you anything out of the ordinary here, okay? Okay, so he comes back and he says the following. He says, you're asking me what the ether is again. Yeah, I'm asking you what is the ether. Point to it. He says, and I already told you multiple times. No, no I don't want you to tell me. I want you to point a name. I want you to identify an, a physical object. I want you to put a shape there in front of us and say, that's the ether. How, how difficult can that be? Okay. And then he says, on the other hand, you haven't told us what your ropes are. I haven't told you what a rope, my ropes are? Yes, I have. Look, this is what a rope is. I'm sorry you've never seen one in your life, but uh, this is what a rope looks like. This is what a rope is. The word rope anywhere in the universe it looks something like this. Maybe it's this is a two-strand rope. You can find a three-strand strand rope out there. In fact, um, here it is. Let me show you. Okay, uh, let me put it over here. Okay, that's what a rope is. Looks like uh, the, the top one is a two-strand rope. The lower one has a three-strand. But that's more or less what a rope looks like. Now, if you go to the land of the in, uh, Klingons, they they don't call it rope. They call it epor. They use it exactly in reverse. Okay, no problem. So they call it epor. But epor over there and rope over here are the same thing. They point to an object. You can call it X for all we care. And I'm showing you what it is. It's uh, right out there at the bottom in black, in a black uh, rectangle there. Uh, rope is a two-strand rope. When the atoms expand and contract, you know, they torque the rope, and that's what we call light. I don't know what part you're missing, what part uh, you can't under understand. This is kindergarten stuff, so I I'm not sure why it's over your head. Okay? And... Um, and we also go a little beyond the call of duty, and we also show, you know, how it's uh, um, uh, how how it relates to the uh, wave. Okay, let me remove this for a second here. Okay, you can see why um, we put the rope. The rope uh, matches exactly what the wave has always been. You know, they have this so-called wave uh, made of two fields. One is the called the electric, the other one the magnetic. And uh, we call them threads. We're saying that they're physical objects. Because, see, the wave, electromagnetic wave, it's made out of vectors. And these people don't understand it. They think they're looking at an object. And no, it's not. Uh, what you have is all these engine arrows that uh, are pointing in different directions. And what you're staring at is magnitude and directions. What you're staring at is a mathematical concept, not a physical object. So when they say it's an electric field in a magnetic field, they're talking about concepts. They're not, what is a field? A bunch of numbers. That's all a field is. And so, uh, and besides, it travels one way because it, it's allegedly emitted by an atom, okay, when it quantum jumps. So what you have there is a concept, first of all, and they're talking about numbers, they're talking about quantities, and uh, it also goes one way, which is irrational because numbers never travel. 
okay but this is what you're staring at you're you're staring at um, a picture of traveling numbers vectors okay and um and what we're saying no what what these people have always mistaken light for is this uh, wave and it's not a wave it's a rope a rope that uh, has the same shape okay it's a two-strand rope and we we're, were just to keep with convention we call it the electric thread and the magnetic thread and yes uh, we can explain at least why light travels at a constant speed okay why because you have the wave equation there where c is the uh, velocity of light 300,000 kilometers per second and it's equal to frequency times wavelength if you increase the frequency the wavelength goes down and if you increase the wavelength the frequency goes down and there you see why we have an explanation for that we're saying that if you take any rope any length of rope okay you torque it more and more and more right you have a one meter length uh, of rope and you torque it more and more and more well you're going to get shorter links and you're going to get more links and that's why c is a constant why light always travels at the same speed okay because it doesn't travel at all it's just what we're looking at is the number of uh humps you know that we get uh in a given length of rope that's all it is okay so uh we do have an explanation for why the rope is the good model a perfect model for what they've always been uh calling a wave a transverse wave and as you can see you know the rope since it torques right the uh, signal travels both ways simultaneously it's the only object that can do that. And it's the only object that can imitate the wave equation. It's got a lot of uh, things it's in its favor. Okay. Okay. So um, let me get this fellow back here. Uh, and so he says, uh, on, uh, on the other hand, you haven't told us what your ropes are. Yeah, I have told you. And there you see it. Here's the construction. Okay. That's why also it's related to the atoms. Okay. You can see uh, how an atom is um, made. And it's made of the same thread that makes up the rope. So we have rope, atom, rope, atom, rope, atom, forever, right? As so far as you want to go. And what you see is how it's made. You know, one thread goes around and encapsulates the, one, the thread that goes through the center of the atom and comes out the other end. So an atom is a perfectly round sphere. It is a sphere. It's a membrane. The electron is a membrane, not a little particle. And the membrane encapsulates a star, which is the proton. The proton is a star. There you see it. Okay, and you can see how uh, the they stop at the uh, electron shell, which is the red one there. Let me see it one. Let's look at it one more time. You see the electron shell, which is the red one, and it's uh, there is a 2D version of it. Okay, but you'll see now the 3D version there. Okay, and what it is is you know one thread goes around, the other one goes through, and it builds this thing we call an atom. It's like a knot in uh, in the uh, uh, world of matter. Okay. Okay, so we do have a consistent uh, picture of, of it all. We have two atoms, which are made of the same threads as the rope that interconnects them. The atoms expand and contract, and when they do so, they torque the rope, and light travels in both directions, which is a signal that we can call it propagates. What really is happening is, you know, the rope is really twirling in place, but we can say it propagates through the rope. And you can see that. You can twist any rope, and you can see the signal is at the other end instantaneously, practically instantaneously. In fact, uh, you can do the trick. I've done it several times where you put two, um, you, t you get a rope, very tight rope, right? You put two um, uh, clothespins at each end and you just move one clothespin, you'll see the other one move instantaneously. You had better. <laughs> okay? And the tighter that you make the rope, the faster you'll get that. And that's our uh, model for, uh, for light. What we're saying is light is a very, very thin, extremely thin, un invisibly, invisibly thin rope made of two strands, uh, a braided uh, helical, right? And uh, the atoms expand and contract. When doing so, they open and close. In other words, the uh, rope, uh, at the, the two threads that uh, merge into it. And by doing so, it torques the rope and light goes in both directions. Uh, the links on the rope, the shorter they are, you have high frequency, meaning many links and the links are shorter. And if um, the links are longer, then you're going to have fewer links. Very simple stuff. Baby stuff, kindergarten stuff. Okay, They never figured it out. Why? Because they've been dealing with math and with waves and with particles. 
That's why they never figured it out. So we're brushing all that aside, throwing it all in the trash can in the ash heap of history, the only site in the, on the planet here, right? We're getting rid of all that. We're saying, look, what they've been mistaking all these years is a rope uh, and it, for a wave. Okay? They, they thought it was a wave all these years. Okay. Um, and this fellow says, yeah, nothing mystical uh, or metaphysical, entirely rational. No, your, yours is not rational until you can take a, give us a picture. Then you cannot even start your presentation because we don't know what you're talking about when you say ether. Okay. And he says, he gave up. He says, he says I'm not discussing ether with you anymore. You're only obsessed with semantics. Yeah, they dismiss it as semantics uh, because um, uh, they can't answer the question. And the question is very simple point to it. That's the question. See how easy it is? Just, point you know, here I'm pointing at, at the rope. I'm showing you a rope. I'm saying what it is. So don't say that I'm not presenting the rope. I am presenting the rope. Okay. Okay. And uh, we're, uh, you know, the rope is made of really a single thread that's in the universe. We're saying that that's all there is. This is all, all matter is made out of that single thread. It's a closed loop thread. And this thread uh, just twines around itself and creates everything, every bit of matter in the universe. So every bit of matter in the universe is physically physically interconnected why because we're all one thread you're connected to me i'm connected to the other guy every atom is connected to all others through a pair of twine threads and it's a single thread in the universe if we could untangle every atom every rope in the universe we would end up with what you see there you know like a rubber band uh, you know Th this is the universe right there folks okay uh where is it okay that's it that's that's the whole that's the whole universe that's all the matter, sorry, all the matter in the universe. Then you have space, which is the counterpart. And what is space? Nothing. What is nothing? It's that which has no shape. So we have a definition that we can use consistently. That which has no shape, and we have that which has shape, and then we have that which has shape over and with a background of that which doesn't have shape. Very simple. Matter uh, made of a single thread, and what you have as a background is nothing. Space, that which has no shape. Okay, easy? Okay, and uh, we can have two universes, okay, maybe there are two threads in the universe uh, or uh, in space, okay, and I hate to use the word in space because space is not a container, but what we're saying is that there are two threads just twirling uh, in this black stuff that serves as a backdrop, okay. Now, what does that mean? That means that, you know, maybe there's a parallel universe, okay, out there. Maybe there's a yet another universe which uh, none of its atoms are connected to our universe, so these are two different universes. Why? Because none of the atoms are connected to each other. All the atoms in one thread are connected amongst themselves, and all the atoms of the other thread are connected between themselves. But none of them are connected to ours. So you can have a parallel universe under the uh, rope model. Uh, speculation, we don't care about that really. It's just uh, interesting to, you know, to shoot the bull around at the water cooler and nothing more. But all I'm saying is that our universe is just a single thread that connects every atom through uh, two uh, twine threads that are made of that same thread, okay, period. That's very easy, really. And um, kindergarten stuff, you don't need any math to understand it, hopefully, because physics is not about math. Physics is not descriptions, quantitative descriptions, which is all that math is. Uh, physics is about explaining how this universe works, and that's our starting point. I'm showing you the hypothesis, the assumptions we have to make and from there, we're going to explain, you know, how light works, how gravity works, and all this other good stuff. That's how it begins. But that's our starting point, what you just said there. So, yeah, don't tell me that I'm not presenting. I'm presenting the rope. I'm pointing to it here. I'm pointing it to it one more time. If you don't believe me that this is a rope, go to your hardware store, ask uh, for a two-strand rope, and they're going to give you something similar to this. They might say, how, how much do you want of it? <laughs> but they'll give you something in your hand that you can take home with you. Now go to the same hardware store and say, uh, could you give me a pound of ether? <laughs> what will they give you? <laughs> give me some ether. <laughs> so uh, the guy says, okay, let me see if it's in the catalog. <laughs> so yeah, you can't ask for ether because nobody has any idea what the ether is, as you can see there. Okay. So uh, Fowl says, continues, says, point to me your ropes. Okay, I pointed to my rope. There it is, okay? Uh, here it is. Okay, I'm pointing to my rope, okay? So there it is. Okay, so please don't tell me I can't point to my rope. I never said the ether was an object. Okay, so if it's not an object, what is it? It's a concept? I mean, there's only objects and concepts. There's nothing else. There's no third category of words. 
every word in the dictionary, it either designates something that has shape or that which doesn't. Okay? So all those things, that all those words that designate that which doesn't have shape, those are all concepts. See how simple it is? So if you say conscience, well, you can't point to conscience. Mind, I can't point to mind. Thought, I can't point to thought. Why? Because these are concepts. But you say tree, I can point to a tree, I can point to a dog, I can point to a cat. Okay, so you can point to things, but you can't point to concepts. Every word in the dictionary falls under one of those two categories. Either it has shape and it's an object, or it don't have shape and it's a concept. That, that's the rule of thumb. Very simple. Okay, you can go ahead and look at the dictionary and see if you can separate all the words between concept and object. Okay, so yeah, the question is, if ether uh, does not have shape, it doesn't have, uh, it's not an object, then it's a concept. And if it's a concept, you can't say you're going to move a concept around. You can't vibrate the concept. Like you vibrate a field, you know, a field is a concept. How do you vibrate a, a region of numbers? What do you, uh, you know, how do you excite them? They said an excited field or whatever, vibrating teal uh, uh, field or an oscillating field or whatever. You know, you can't have that because it's a concept. It's a bunch of numbers. That's what a field is. That's what the word field designates. That's what, it's, that's how it's defined officially. So you can't say you're going to vibrate a bunch of numbers, which is what you're saying when you say you vibrate a field. Okay, so people don't understand that. They say, they, they first define it as a bunch of numbers in a region and then they don't use that at all. They say, okay, let's move the field, and the field pushes the charge, and you know they start talking a bunch of nonsense, treating the word field as a physical object when they just finished defining it as a bunch of numbers. They did that. See, they, they're, they've got a contradiction that they don't never resolve. Okay, so this is the issue. And so he says, uh, of course it has no shape. Well, it has no shape. It's not an object. It's not a thing. But see, he uses the word substance. He says, it's a physical substance nonetheless. Oh, my God, we have to start uh, very simple with some of these people. Anyways, um, he says, does air have shape? Does water have shape? Yes, they do. And he says, no, they don't. Water doesn't have shape. Air doesn't have shape. And he says, the shape is defined by a container. Absolutely not. You've got this wrong, bud. And a lot of people make the same mistake. They say water doesn't have shape. Air doesn't have shape. Let's, let's make it sure that you understand kindergarten physics. I'm talking about kindergarten physics. You know, that's before first grade, okay? Before, hopefully before high school or college. Anything made of atoms had better have shape because atoms have shape. And if an atom has shape and builds molecules which have shape and molecules build gases and liquids and solids, right? Then they all have shape. Anything made out of atoms had better have shape. And so he says uh, he doesn't believe air has shape or that water has shape. And I've already shown him. He doesn't. Uh, uh, apparently, he's not watching. I don't know or listening. I, I guess he's got a mental block or something. Here it is one more time. The astronaut releases a blob of water of uh, of some liquid, some fluid. <laughs> we'll call it a fluid. How's that? He releases a fluid from his spaceship. There's no container because that thing is floating in what? In space, meaning in nothing. It has no container. And the question is, does that blob have shape? And hopefully the answer is yes, it has shape. And you may say, well, what is the shape of? That's not the question. The question is, uh, uh, does it have shape? Not what is the shape of? Okay? Of course, when you see a blob, you say, well, that's an irregular shape, uh, you know, undescribable shape. You know, we don't care about that. We're saying, does it have shape? And the answer is yes. Hopefully it has shape. If you have eyes, you would say it has shape. Now, it, it, maybe that one's uh, too neat a shape. Maybe it looks more like, like this one here. What if it looks like that? Okay. Uh, does that have shape? Well, hopefully it does. I mean, what you're staring at is, is a shape. And if that's what it looks like in shape when the astronaut releases the blob of whatever, of gas or of uh, some liquid, well, then that has shape. It's a yes or no type of question. Does it have shape or not? And the answer is yes, it does have shape. So, um, so again, uh, these people have it all wrong. They, 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 they don't have, know the basics. They, they don't know simple things like that water has shape, air has shape. The air around the earth, does it have shape? Yes, it looks like a shell. I mean, if you had the eyes of God, you would see a shell, which gets thinner and thinner as, as you go outwards. If you take the earth away, if you could do that, right? If you eliminate the earth, you would see a shell of molecules covering the earth. What is the shape of air? Well, around the earth, it looks like a shell. It looks like an eggshell. It just gets thinner as, as, as you go out further outwards. 
hopefully air has shape hopefully if air, air is an object and people will say well object that sounds so bad in my ear that's because you're thinking of ordinary speech we can't use the words the definitions the notions of ordinary speech and bring them into science that's why we have to define all these words for the purposes of physics of science because people confuse ordinary speech with scientific language and when they want to bring those things in, we say, look, you're going to have to justify every definition. And they don't like that. They say, oh, you're doing word salad. <laughs> you're doing semantics, Bill. You're doing ontology or who knows what philosophy. So, yeah, uh, we have to define these things. And uh, so can you point me to air? Yeah, we can point to air. It's just color coded and I can point it out to you. Air is just a bunch of molecules, a bunch of atoms. You know, it's fuzzy air, but we can't see it. But if we could color code it, if, if it had color, you could do it with some other gas that has color, and you release it in outer space without a container, no container, right? You would see a blob. That blob hopefully has shape, otherwise you need to see an ophthalmologist. Okay, very simple, very straightforward. Okay, uh, so, but what's the issue? We gotta start with uh, kindergarten physics for all these guys. These people never went through kindergarten and they wanna do college stuff. They say, look, I don't wanna do semantics. I don't wanna do word salad, word wizardry, all that stuff you do, Bill. I just wanna do physics. Well, I'm sorry to tell you, physics is 150% word salad. Okay, you gotta get, you gotta lay the foundations. And one of the problems we have is that nobody's defined the discipline. Nobody has a definition of what physics is. Nobody has a definition of what uh, science is or what philosophy is. Go to the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. Number one, probably a dictionary or encyclopedia of philosophy on the planet. Very well set up, very well argued, etc. everywhere, right? And look up the word philosophy and you won't find it. So here you have the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy and, they, and the word they never defined is the word philosophy. So we don't know what the, what the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy is about because they don't define the word that defines their uh, discipline. So we don't know what philosophy is and uh, physics is in the same boat. What is physics? Well, they say blah, 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 it's the study of energy. What do you mean the study of energy? What is energy? And they say, oh, we don't know, but we study it. Uh, they don't know what energy, they can't define it. They say there's a million types of energy, potential energy, and who knows what kind of energy. And they say, we don't know what energy is, but we're studying it. That's what we study. And yeah, anytime they begin any discipline by saying the study of, you know, it's a retarded person who wrote that definition. You know, what is paleontology? The study of, what is biology? The study of, like there are no biologists on earth. Why? Because you ask a biologist, what do you, what do, you do? Uh, I'm a biologist. Oh, you're a biologist. Uh, so what is a biologist? Well, we study life. You study life. Uh, what is life? Oh, we don't know. We don't have a definition, but that's what we study. And so, you know, my kid, uh, when he was in uh, kindergarten, he studied blocks. And he would put one block on top of the other. He studied blocks. So was he a scientist because he studied blocks? The, does a person who studies, I don't know, math or history and fails the test, the fact that they uh, you know, didn't get any question right, the fact that they studied, does that make them a historian, a physicist, or whatever? No, so any person who defines a discipline as the study of doesn't have no squat. You don't define any discipline like that. And so this is the problem, they say the study of. No, science is not the study of nothing. Uh, science is explanations, rational explanations. That's what science is. If you have an irrational explanation, it doesn't belong in science. And for that, you have to define what an explanation is and what rational means. And I've gone through that in the past, and I won't touch that today. But yeah, it has to be rational explanation. It's a, if it's an irrational explanation, like everything that comes out of mathematical physics, in fact, everything, every single thing, 100% that comes out of mathematical physics is irrational. None of it has anything to do with physics or with science. Okay? Warping time, that, that's a, an explanation, that's a rational explanation. Particle at two places at once, no, none of that belongs in science, period. We're done. I mean, they can say whatever they want at the asylum over there, mathematical asylum. Uh, they don't fool people who have a little bit of uh, more, uh, what do you call it, street smartness, <laughs> okay? 
Uh, okay, so let's take these fellows to uh, kindergarten physics. They have to go through kindergarten physics because they, they've never taken kindergarten. They skipped kindergarten. They want to jump directly to college. Okay, so here let's go with kindergarten physics. Okay, so here we have uh, kindergarten physics. And what this fellow didn't understand is that he says, well, it's a thing. It's a substance, but it's not, uh, not a, an object. <laughs> well, object is a synonym of thing, a synonym of substance, a synonym of material, what you call it, any of those. They're all synonyms, synonyms, perfect synonyms for the purposes of physics. There's only objects and concepts. That's it. And then on the other side, you have uh, that which doesn't have shape. And there you see some synonyms, nothing, space, emptiness, void, vacuum. Okay. So this is the first step. You need to differentiate nothing from something. And hopefully nothing and something are antonyms, and we can use them consistently in any exposition, any dissertation. Okay? So when he says, look, it's, it's, it's not a thing or it's, a, it's not a, uh, an object, but it's a substance, he's just contradicting himself because he never defined what an object is. And as soon as you bring that up, he says, oh, you're doing semantics, Bill. You're doing word, word salad, word wizardry. Okay? So, uh, yeah, we have to start at the beginning, and here are the foundations that no one ever uh, established for the purposes of physics, actually for all of science, right? And here it is. Uh, these are what we call the foundations, what all these people call semantics, word salad, rubbish. Uh, they have all these good words for it, right? No one ever discovered that you must define the word object. In fact, I keep saying that my biggest contribution to science, to physics, is not the, the rope model. It's having discovered the word object, the word thing. No one in 10,000 years ever defined what a thing is. And I'll tell you partly why. You know, uh, part of the reason for that is that, uh, let me get this. Part of the reason for that is that the word object, the physicists or researchers in physics, natural philosophy, whatever you want to call it, they delegated that job to philosophers. In fact, the philosophers took that word first because you go all the way to the days of the Greeks. And uh, they started doing, you know, a mixture of philosophy and physics. And then that kind of branched out in the 17th century. And uh, physicists, or so-called physicists, they, uh, natural philosophers, whatever they were called, uh, they said, hey, you know, uh, objects, that's, that's the job of philosophers. They have to define that. English majors, uh, you know, people who deal with semantics, ontology, all that stuff. And so here you have uh, a contradiction or a weird world where you have the so-called philosophers, whatever they are, because again, we don't have a definition for philosophy, but it's the philosophers, the guys on the other side of campus who have to define the bread and butter of the guys that work in physics on the other side of campus. And the fellows who have to do physics, the people who have to explain how this universe works, they said, oh, you want to know what an object is? You got to go to the other side of campus. And so you go over there and you say, okay, uh, what do you guys do? Well, we do philosophy. Okay, what do you do? Well, we study ontology and epistemology and metaphysics and a whole bunch of nonsense that we don't understand. Okay, and what is an object? And you know, we, we, we still haven't defined it. To this day, they're still, <laughs> look at the, again, the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy or any, any dictionary or uh, uh, encyclopedia, and you will not find a definition, a, a rational definition of the word object, of the word thing, something, right, that we can use in physics. And uh, the physicists are not even aware of it, the mathematical physics. They, they do, they, we do equations. And you say, well, what, what are you doing equations for? Well, so that we can explain how this universe works. And they try to give you an explanation. They give you an irrational explanation. You say, but that's not an object. And they say, oh, but you're doing semantics. You want to know what an object is, go to the other side of campus. <laughs> and so you never win it with them, you know, because the people who have no stake in the word object, in the word thing, are the ones defining it for those who do have a stake in the word thing. Because they're, giving you a, they're going to give you a physical interpretation. They always do, because otherwise their math is worthless. And they're going to give you a physical interpretation of their equation we say it's irrational, and they say, well, yeah, we don't understand it either, and Father Universe doesn't speak our language, and we don't speak his language, and they give you the runaround when it's very simple. They never define the word object. That's the whole problem. Okay, so um, uh, that's one issue. The other one is that they never define the word exist. No one ever defined the word exist, and it turns out that you can't do physics without an object, and physics is the science of existence. Physics uh, only deals with uh, with uh, the world that the world that exists out there we're trying to figure out what exists out there in the this invisible world 
and um, and yeah, uh, we're trying based on what we think exists out there. Then we can create mechanisms to say, look, this is how gravity works. This is how light works, we, we, or electricity, or magnetism. We can because now we've identified the invisible, intangible object that Mother Nature and Father Universe use. Okay, that's the way it works. But if you don't know what an object is, well, then uh, we got to start a little earlier. And none, no one has ever defined the word object and exist. That's why they go around in circles. You know, here you have, uh, you ask this question, you know, why do athe uh, atheists, theists, and agnostics go around in circles when someone asks, does God exist? Well, I'll tell you why. Because they never define the word exist, let alone God. But, I mean... If you don't know what the word exist means, what are you saying when you say that God does not exist, God does exist, you don't know whether God exists, I know God exists, I believe God exists. What are you saying when you say exist? And nobody ever defined the word exist, and that's why to this day they all go around in circles with this famous word. So nobody knows what an object is, nobody knows what exist means, and those are the two first words you have to define in physics. And that's why we have irrational explanations today. Uh, and the question is, who's doing word salad? Is it uh, people who try to define these terms and, you know, uh, etch them in stone? Or is it people who avoid and say, oh, that's just word wizardry? So that's what you got to think about, you know. Uh, someone has to define these words, and we can't use the words. We can't use tradition. We can't use authority. We can't use the dictionary anymore. None of the words in the dictionary are properly defined. We have to redefine them for the purposes of science, of physics, among them the disciplines themselves. So nobody has defined these words and people think that everything's been settled when nothing, absolutely nothing has been settled. Nobody knows what an object is, nobody knows what exists means, nobody knows what physics is about or what physics is supposed to do. They move energy. What do you mean you're moving energy? I thought, and why are you talking about matter if you're saying that uh, mathematical physics is just equations and numbers? What does matter have to do with equations? So yeah, when they talk about matter and energy, which is how they typically define physics in terms of those two words you say what does that have to do with math which they say is the language of physics and the, and they're saying no but physics is matter so what are you going to put in your equation the word matter are you going to put an atom there or what are you going to put in there no you're going to put a value and that's got nothing to do with the definition you just gave for physics so there, there's a contradiction between what these people say is their job description which is just doing equations and how they define physics there's a, there's a contradiction that's never been resolved. So don't tell me everything's been settled and that we're doing word wizardry here. Okay, um, here are some words that uh, are at the foundations of physics. The ones on the left are the ones we need in physics. The one on the right are the ones that the mathematical establishment uh, uses to get their um, theories across, their, their propaganda, really, nothing more than propaganda, right? So these are the, the terms that they use over there on the right. And a lot of them are unscientific and irrational. In fact, all of them are used in, in the wrong context, etc., because they talk about proof and evidence and predictions and observation, none of which has anything at all to do with science. Now, in science, we do not observe. We do not gawk. In science, we have to explain. Science, we do not study. We do not make predictions. We're not astrologers, okay? This is not a, uh, predicting which horse is going to win the race. None of that. We, we don't make predictions in science. We don't do equations in science. So in, in equations, is only a description, a, math, a quantitative description of some phenomena. That's not science. That's like saying that a chair has four legs and you put the equation, four legs plus one back rust. That's not science. That's a description. And science is not about describing, it's about explaining. For that, you need to know the difference between an explanation and a description. And no, an explanation is not a series of descriptions. And again, uh, it takes two years for some of these people to understand the difference between an explanation and a description first. And therefore, they can't tell the difference between math and science and math and physics. Okay, so this is, this is where, where the problems are. Okay, and um, so these are the foundations, the main words that we need to establish the foundations of physics. Okay, unless you know these words, you haven't gone through kindergarten physics. Something that which has shape. Nothing that which doesn't have shape. Very straightforward, simple, right? Distance, separation between two objects. Location is the set of distances, you know, from one object to all the others. That's the location of that atom, that thing, with respect to all other matter in the universe. 
Okay, that's the location in the universe. No reference frames or anything like that. No observers. We don't have observers in science. No one gawking. Location simply objectively defined. It's just a set of distances. Exist is, you know, an object that has location. Okay, so if, uh, if God wants to exist, God not only has to be an object, God cannot be a concept. You cannot say God is love, God is intelligence. No, not in science. That's okay in uh, the world of poetry. That's okay over there. Don't bring that into physics. In physics, if God wants to exist, first he's got to be an object. And you say, well, God's a man. He's got two arms, two eyes, and ears. No problem. Now he's an object. You point, say that bearded guy, you know, there, that's God. No problem. We're done. You, you presented God. Now, if God wants to exist, God has to have location. And the, the rope model, he's got to be part of the thread. Okay? The single thread, the universal thread. Okay? He's got to be part of that thread. Um, he could be a separate thread, like you know, we just saw a separate thread. We can say that thread is God. But then he has no influence over us because this God has no way of reaching us and we have no way of reaching him. You know, he has no way of touching, seeing, doing anything with us because the only way you can see is through the rope. The only way you can hear is through atoms. And none of his atoms are connected to our atoms. So we can't hear him. We can't see him. We can't do anything with God. Okay. So as far as we're concerned, he doesn't exist. But uh, he does exist in the sense that he would be made of atoms that are parallel to the single thread that makes our universe. In that sense, you can say God exists. But it doesn't matter because he has no way of contacting us. So... He couldn't have created us either. <laughs> okay? And concept, well, motion to or more location concept, the word that invokes or embodies two objects, two or two words treated as object. So object is to one like concept is to two. Okay? That's the bottom line. That's how we start our, um, our physics foundations. That's, those, that's how you start you know, your, your presentation, showing uh, what an object is, what exists means, now, and what a... You know what you're proposing i'm proposing the rope okay so i hope we're done right hope you hopefully everybody can follow my presentation doesn't mean you believe it we don't care about belief in science you can believe whatever you want i'm here we're here just so that you understand 